Hey, it's Thomas Mulready from CoolCleveland.com, and we're Skyping today with Natasha Tarofsky from her studios in Montreal, Canada, and Paul Sykes, who's from Cleveland. He's the international art dealer who represents Natasha. He owns the Beck Cafe, and he had to go all the way to Montreal for us to talk to him. Welcome, you guys, to Skype and to Cool Cleveland. Our pleasure, Tom. Hey, thanks for taking time to talk. Natasha, congratulations on all your great success, and we're so happy that you're coming back to Cleveland. I'm very happy to, to come back. You've been here before, haven't you? And uh, you've exhibited your work, and yeah. uh, you played your violin as well. So you're not only a painter, but you're also a musician. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I've been a musician since, uh, well, practically almost since I was born. Because my whole family is musicians, and so, right. or maybe even before I was born, you know. So I started violin at seven. I started actually art much later than this, and it was actually the biggest surprise of my life that I started art. And actually, I have to thank it for it my mom because I would never start it. She was kind of just she was sure I had a good hand for it, and she was pushing me into it because she's also a musician and an artist as well, and. Uh, yeah, that's And we're seeing some of your art behind you here as well. This one is called the Slightly Pink Zebra. Yeah. And I love the surrealist look that you have. I mean, these really are true surrealist paintings that you have, a, a real style. Um, and you call yourself a surrealist, and you say that you became a surrealist at the age of three. <laughs> How did yeah. that happen? Well, we were playing a game with my mom again, uh, just inventing some stories. And that story was about the little cucumber who was married to a bear. So I, I, I assume that was already surreal enough. So I just continued it later on when I started playing, uh, doing art. Yeah. Right. So you, and this one is another interesting one called uh, Watermelons in Venice. Yeah. And we see the watermelons and we see the gondola. And, Actually, oh, go ahead. It's a last painting which I did. Uh, yeah, I just finished it. Just yeah. finished this one. Paul, what is it about Natasha's work that, that struck you? What, what first attracted you to her work? I think, Tom, it would be the surrealism. Um, I just absolutely uh, love Natasha's works. I've been representing her for 15 years now. We've had her live in Cleveland from Tower City Center back in the old Art Avenue days uh, to the Oberlin Conservatory of Music. Uh, they brought the entire orchestra there, her father's orchestra. We did a, a big thing at the Cleveland Institute of Music, this famous thing called Pictures at an Exhibition, where we actually had Natasha took 15 of her paintings and she created this movie where they digitally animated the, animated the paintings tying to classical music. So they're called the choreographed paintings. And it became a huge success in Cleveland. And this was back in 2007. So we haven't had Natasha live in Cleveland since 2007, folks. So we really are excited to have her back at the Beck Center. I am also excited to go back. <laughs> well, it's going to be, how many works will we see, Paul, at, uh, in Cleveland? Oh, goodness, there will be at least, I'm going to say about between 70, 75 works will be shown on, ex on exhibit, including two very large murals that will greet them as they drive through the driveway of the Beck Center, a painting called The Night at the Opera, which right now is valued at $1 million for the painting. And there's also another painting called The Beck Stage. And Natasha, tell Tom how large the Night of the Opera painting is. Well, it's uh, what, 11 meters by 5 meters, something like that. So 30, 33 feet wide, 17 and a half feet tall. It's one of the largest paintings in the world, actually. On a freestanding canvas, on a Levi Strauss blue denim canvas, she created this beautiful painting called A Night at the Opera. So you've been really, I don't want to say obsessed with musical themes, but it's been a big part of your of your painting as well as your your life. How, how important is music in your life? Well, it's there all the time. You know, whether you think about it directly or uh, not. Uh, sometimes it's collaborations uh, with my orchestra, like Night at the Opera was made for opera. And sometimes it's just there. Sometimes I would get ideas during the uh, rehearsals. And um, and 90% of time I work with music on. Right. It's there. <laughs> This one uh, is called the Happiness Vendor, yeah. Yeah. and you've got these great masks with smiling faces. See the sales sign and the happiness. Get it? The you know yeah. the ching yeah. ching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's on sale now. It's on sale. <laughs> 
your your pictures at an exhibition. Uh, I thought that was interesting because you you take this after, of course, Mussorgsky, um, who created his musical work for piano. I believe the original one was. We all know the Ravel orchestration of it, but the original piece was for piano. After he saw the works of Victor Hartman, but most of those works have been lost, and we. I think it's interesting that we have the music left of his responses, but we don't have the actual paintings. When you created that, Natasha, your your sort of response to that, were you trying to fill in the gaps and say, well, maybe these were the kinds of paintings that Mussorgsky was, was looking at when he created it, or what was your thinking? Well, actually, it was, again, uh, my father, who is the director uh, of Musici de Morel, who commissioned me this because he did his own... Uh, um, transcription for chamber orchestra and he decided since there's no more paintings but I should make my own interpretation of Mussorgsky music so I did the opposite of what Mussorgsky did so I relied on a, on a music, on a color music on the, um, well, the titles which were quite funny, original titles of Mussorgsky and so I listened again thousands of times each movement and tried to create uh, each, each uh, image to it yeah. That's fascinating. And and you have worked with your father. E Musici de Montreal Chamber Orchestra is one of the busiest orchestras in the entire world. I think they do over a hundred concerts per year, which is just incredible. This one here behind you now is called Floating Angel. Yeah. <laughs> really beautiful. Your 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 use of color, uh, the elongated figures, uh, the ethereal nature of almost everything that you do, the dreamlike quality. I have to ask, you know, how do you do both? How do you do music and painting? I understand you're on sabbatical now, and you've sort of stepped away from Imizishi for a while to focus on your painting. But how do you manage to do both, either, and, and, and at such a high level for both? Um, well, main thing, not to sleep too much. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, uh, well, yeah, you, you know, the music is not nine to five jobs, so sometimes you're super busy. Sometimes you have uh, a few few days here and there, a week or three. Uh, somehow, though, you would always get in the same time some solo playing and an uh, exhibition. Yeah. So you can have a big break and then everything in the same time. But now I I, uh, I really want to concentrate mostly on art. These are these are big canvases, and and your work is large. I, how do you take those on the road with you when you travel? I mean, I can see a little sketch pad, or or do you do that? Do you sketch on the road and then come home to your studio? I do, but maybe when I started, maybe one year after I started painting, uh, to make myself feel that I'm really a professional artist, I I'm I was traveling actually with canvases, with oils, and uh, got everybody. All in color, so all my roommates were all <laughs> very close, were all bunch of colors on it. So, but that lasts for one year. Now I just travel always with my sketch. Right. This one behind you is called Charge, and I love this one. This one really is is all about Natasha's surrealism. The the people and the horse are facing backwards from each other. It's yeah. just classic mm -hmm. quintessential Tarowski. <laughs> are you? Uh, do you? Do you? Go from your own dreams, Natasha. Are you are you taking these from imagery in your dreams, or do you start somewhere with a thought and then just sort of develop it on the canvas? Well, you know, it's each is different. It's funny. This one actually started from nothing, from abstraction. Uh, I was not in the mood for thinking, and I decided I'll just start a big abstraction. I started and then became this. So I don't know what happened in between. You know, I I didn't have intentions to do this one. It just appeared from somewhere. Uh, sometimes I, I, if I have idea, I really sketch it out until I feel it's ready, and then go to the canvas, and then again, you never know what will happen. Sometimes it's exactly what I wanted, and sometimes it becomes completely something else. But smaller pieces are more abstract, so I, I yeah, I, each each painting now is a little bit it has its own history. And even though you do abstract looking work. The human body is very, very important in your work, and it's in, in most of your paintings, I've noticed. It, it, is there something you're trying to say about, about people? Um, you, you look back to artists like uh, Egon Shela and Marc Chagall, Gustav Klimt, obviously, and the Surrealists. I mean, you see a little bit of Salvador Dali in your work. Uh, you know, Giacometti, you can see, Brancusi. I mean, you see a lot of, of uh, influences there. 
are you, do you have a theme or a theory about humans in the world or, or any thoughts on that or is it just each picture is different? I think still each picture is different but um, you know I did one uh, I took one class in the uh, portrait class and I did one very realistic photo uh, well almost not photo but uh, realistic painting and I consider it my passport, but I never have to do it again. Uh, for me, it's more interesting to express somehow the, uh, the feeling, the, the face, with less uh, actual realistic, uh, you know, tools. You know, so it's more about feeling. It's more about, you know, you mentioned Chile. For me, he was a big influence in the sense of I like his tension. You know, or lack of tension. You know, if there's movement, there's uh, expression. But it's more challenging for me to express with, without mouth what mouth would express. You know. Right. But again, it depends on the painting. Sometimes I I, I want to use more uh, real tools also. Well, this is amazing, wonderful stuff. We've gotten to see a lot of it in Cleveland. Even when you're not here, your work is here because of Paul. But for you to bring all these new works to the Beck Center for a big exhibition, this will be Thursday, October 13th from 6 to 9 at the Beck Center. Uh, and we'll have a lot of information online and on Cool Cleveland as well. Thank you so much for sharing, for bringing us into your studio. Thank you, Paul, for going all the way to Montreal to hook us up. And we'll look forward to seeing you guys both here in very soon back here in Cleveland. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. We really, really can't thank you enough for allowing us this wonderful opportunity to be on CoolCleveland.com. Thank you. Well, this is Thomas Mulready from CoolCleveland.com. Have a great week in Cool Cleveland. Have a great week.